Welcome to the Coffee House, where in the next hour, whatever happened to former Maryland Governor Paris Clendenning? On the first half of the show, a chat with Governor Clendenning about his political legacy. The top of the ticket races this year in Maryland, sprawl, gay marriage, immigration, global warming, and capital punishment. Then, the unique sounds of Kiva, poetry by Holly Bass, and Silver Docks director Patricia Finneran previews the 2006 festival, including the trials of Daryl Hunt. How do you know that these people are wrong and you just go on about your life? I could go on with my life, but I would still come back in my country and say, but that boy's innocent, still locked up there. You gotta keep trying. You gotta fight. Even if you go to break, you have got to fight. Welcome to the Forum at the Coffee House. Democrat Paris Glendening served two terms as governor of Maryland, leaving office in January 2003. Before that, Glendenning was executive of Prince George's County and a city councilman in Hyattsville. Glendenning was raised in Florida. His family was poor, no indoor electricity or plumbing. He was the first member of his family to attend college. He earned a Ph.D. at Florida State and taught government and politics at the University of Maryland for 27 years. Paris Glendenning was not universally loved, but even his detractors especially his detractors, acknowledge his political savvy. This being an election year for key state offices, it seemed a good time to get reacquainted with the former governor. I spoke with him on April 25th at the offices of Smart Growth America in Washington, D.C. Welcome, Governor Glendening. Thank you. Um, why don't we begin by getting caught up on Paris Glendening since he left office as governor of Maryland. Since that time, you've been doing what? variety of interesting things, but most importantly, uh, I head something called the uh, Smart Growth Leadership Institute, which is part of Smart Growth America. As I was wrapping up my term, I said, what do I want to do with the rest of my life? And I just feel so strongly about both the environmental issues and what sprawl is doing to this country that uh, when the opportunity came along to head a uh, major uh, national nonprofit on this subject, I jumped at it. Uh, real quickly, Smart Growth America is actually a coalitional organization about 120 coalitions, some of them nationwide, some of them statewide, uh, some of them even uh, regional or local, that are involved with the issue of either stopping sprawl, protecting open space, revitalizing cities, uh, cities uh, supporting mass transit, things of this type. And uh, it's an exciting opportunity. Uh, back in 2004, the Washington Post wrote an article analyzing the effectiveness of smart growth policies in right. Maryland under your administration, came to the conclusion that despite the stated policies, there was really no effect in terms of actual development. Right. I read that with interest. I know people uh, like to cite that. Uh, but um, in fact, there are a number of different things. Uh, number one, you, you, have, you have to realize that we have worked as a nation for 60 years to create the conditions of sprawl the policies, the tax laws, everything else, and you're not going to undo it overnight. Uh, it will take a concerted effort. Uh, candidly, the current administration in Maryland is not as supportive uh, of these programs. Uh, at the same time, however, what we are finding is uh, not just the Maryland model, but smart growth anti-sprawl programs are being adopted all across the country uh, by uh, Democrats, uh, by uh, Republicans, liberals, conservatives. Uh, people recognize we cannot uh, go on the way we're doing and talk about sustainability, talk about dealing with global warming, uh, talk about the problems that affect average families on a daily basis unless we do something with this. Each state is kind of experimenting and pulling together this program. I guess the big difference in terms of models is either you have a very uh, tight regulatory model that says this is going to be the growth boundary. And on that side, almost no growth whatsoever will take place. And on this side is where all of our future growth will occur. Uh, that is obviously, for example, in Portland, Seattle, places like this. Um, in a very abstract way, that might be the best model. And certainly, that's what they use in much of Europe and so on. And if you go to Europe, you know you're either in the town or you're in the country. But there's none of this low density sprawl in between. Um, however, politically, that is just not going to work in most of America. 
And so the other model, which is now known as the smart growth model and which is, is largely based on the Maryland model, is to change uh, the set of assumptions about how things work, stop subsidizing sprawl. And that's what we do right now. The tax code, the building of the highways, the state building of water and sewer lines, schools and everything else subsidizes sprawl. And instead say our policy is to redirect uh, growth to existing communities. Now not just, by the way, the, the big cities. It's not just uh, uh, Baltimore or Chicago or, or uh, Philadelphia or whatever. Uh, the medium and even smaller communities. Uh, how do you redirect growth there? And it's a variety of, of um, um, even little things. It's like saying, uh, if you're not in the area where we're planning for growth to come, then we're not, we, the state, uh, are not going to pay for the roads out there. We're not going to pay for new schools. Uh, you're not going to be eligible for tax credits for job creation or whatever. And we'll change all of that. And instead, if you want those things, then it must be in either the designated growth areas or in existing uh, communities. Some critics say that smart growth deprives the have-nots of access to the American dream. That the cost of a home in the city or in the inner ring suburbs is so expensive now that to get a piece of land you really have to move out to outer suburbia and exurbia. Yet smart growth says that the subsidy should go for development in infill areas. I hear some uh, critics, uh, well funded by the way by the far right from the Cato Institute and from the Heritage Foundation and several others, uh, argue that point. In fact, smart growth is about choice. Uh, we're not saying one has to live any place, we're saying we want to make more choice available. And among other things, look at most urban areas and indeed inner suburbs and see the amount of vacant and abandoned space there, the old mills down by the river or the or the rundown shopping centers and all, and then think about revitalizing those uh, to a mixture of, of housing and jobs and, and recreation and, and shopping and things of this type. That's what we are about. Uh, in fact, it is uh, actually a false economy, and we see this right in this area, to say, okay, a person has to drive, and people are now, uh, two and three hours. So they're going up to West Virginia, Cumberland, Maryland, for a job here. What does that really cost them? Uh, two to three hours each way in commuting time. Uh, it costs a huge amount, and gas right now is at $3 a gallon. It will be before the end of this decade, I have no doubt at all, $5 a gallon. So what happens to your disposable, expendable income in your family? And it seems to me a better alternative is to say that we're going to make sure that workforce housing is available in the existing communities as well. People are starting to connect the dots. And by that I mean they're asking questions like, why can't I be home at my daughter's soccer game instead of sitting in traffic for two hours? Why is my son wheezing with asthma uh, when we never had asthma in our family before? Uh, and the air pollution is so horrible that children's asthma has doubled in the United States in the last uh, uh, 15 years. Uh, or why my, ta my property tax is going up and I see they built three new schools out there where those new subdivisions are, but my local school hasn't been renovated in 25 years. Now when people ask these questions either of themselves or of candidates, what they're starting to understand, it is about land use, it is about the patterns that we have in the United States today. One of the most significant smart growth policies that you attempted to implement or to uh, adopt in order to stop uh, a dumb growth policy was uh, your ultimate opposition to the intercounty connector. Right. Roads by themselves never ever solve the congestion problem and in fact they just add more. What happens is uh, you open up a brand new road or you open up new lanes on a road or whatever and the traffic uh, gets eased a little bit, if you will. Then there's actually mathematicians that have a, a, a formula for this, and they call it the gravitation model. And everyone then moves to that road, and it actually becomes more congested than it was before. In addition to which, uh, when you're talking about trying to uh, control growth, there are certain ways to, to control it or to direct it. Uh, one is to control the uh, water and sewer lines and, and require a connection to the water and sewer lines. Uh, the second one uh, is simply to control the tra access to transportation. This is not a smart growth uh, policy uh, and in fact absorbs by future bonding most of the transportation alternative money uh, that we would have uh, in the state of Maryland. Let's change subjects for a minute. Um, 
Back in 1999, while well, you were governor, the Maryland General Assembly passed the uh, energy deregulation bill, right. electric uh, deregulation bill. Uh, and it was based upon the premise that by separating out production and distribution that you were going to get cleaner, cheaper energy. Uh, you signed that bill. Right. Um, today it's probably 20-20 uh, hindsight to say that maybe it didn't work, that we're looking at 70 percent uh, rate hikes in, in Baltimore. And uh, so on reflection, uh, was that a mistake in policy? Um, it was a bad decision making. Uh, I said it at the time. Uh, as uh, most of the news media have noted, I was very much opposed to it and said it. I said, I don't believe this is going to be a rate reduction, I believe it will be a rate increase. Uh, it was not my major policy initiative, however. The legislative leadership wanted it very, very strongly. Both the Speaker of the House and the President of the Senate argued forcibly for it, the then Speaker uh, of the House forcibly for it, and uh, candidly uh, held the rest of my program hostage uh, until they got a commitment from me uh, that I would sign it. I must say, by the way, I do find it um, uh, interesting for some people to say now that uh, the uh, Democratic legislature passed it. That is correct. However, when I thought about vetoing it uh, before we made this deal with the legislative leaderships, I looked at the numbers. Every Republican in both houses voted for it and were going to vote to override the veto, so that even that wasn't going to work. So I did sign it, uh, certainly in retrospect. Um, uh, Sadly, I guess, uh, my projections uh, came true that uh, this is not good policy. Electricity, by its very nature, is a monopoly. And uh, when you deregulate this way and then have no real control, uh, you should not be surprised if prices go through the roof. There would have been some price increases, no question about it, because fuel costs have gone up. But it would not have been at this level. When you served as the national chairman of the Governors Association 2000-2001, that association took the position that there should be only voluntary controls on greenhouse gas emissions. Also, that association opposed the United States entering the Kyoto Accords. Were you and the association at that time wrong? Uh, my uh, position uh, prior to that, during that debate, and, and uh, after that debate, uh, is that it's a national disgrace uh, in my mind uh, that first of all we don't recognize uh, the reality of global warming. Uh, everyone is recognizing it. I mean there, I sometimes look and think that uh, there are probably only ten people in the whole country uh, that don't recognize global warming and they're all in the White House. Uh, and you know I say that a little bit in jest but, but there's some seriousness about it as well. I, there's not even scientific debate. The only scientific debate now is what type of extreme reactions are we going to get? Is it going to be colder? Is it going to be hotter? Is, is uh, Kansas going to be uh, flooded? Uh, are we going to become a, a uh, uh, tropical jungle uh, here in the mid-Atlantic states? And, and uh, the, the key is that most countries get it and are starting to make changes. Uh, huge challenge with China, which is just starting to emerge, obviously, but most other countries get it. Uh, I think the United States ought not to only sign the Kyoto, uh, agreements, but we ought to be a leader in that. We ought to be very forceful in making sure that it's implemented in this country, and we ought to be a world leader in doing even more. Um, you mentioned earlier the utility deregulation. People look back now and say, well, gee, that was a terrible decision. Why did we do something? I don't want 50 years or so people to look back and see just maybe even less than that, maybe considerably less, but I don't want them to look back and say, you know, we have the most devastating climatic changes with massive flood and routine Category 5 hurricanes and severe droughts in different parts of the world and, and literally hundreds of thousands of people died and millions of people were being relocated because of global warming. What happened back then? Change the emission control policies uh, with re and the mileage re policies with regard to what is permitted within our fleet. I mean, this is outrageous what we do, and including exempting cars and SUVs and so on from the tighter restrictions. And the uh, cafe change, standards have remained the same for exactly change the cafe uh, standards uh, as well. Uh, things like uh, eighty-five percent of our transportation dollars go into roads and building roads. Let's start uh, not an overnight abrupt, you know, uh, crisis-creating situation, but let's start every year at the national, state, and local shifting that so that more and more transportation alternatives and mass transit and walkable communities and so on are available. When you took office, there was a death penalty in Maryland. You ordered a review of it and concluded that there should be a moratorium imposed on the death penalty. 
a moratorium that Governor Ehrlich lifted upon taking office. Almost with glee. I don't want to be unkind, but I mean, I, I watch those press conferences. Um, I will tell you, I, I uh, uh, ran for governor, not really focusing a lot on the death penalty issue. Uh, I was county executive. I, I ran based on what we're going to do on uh, education, uh, on the environment, on creating a more fair and just society. And when I got in, I was faced with a death penalty decision three times. Uh, one, the individual not only admitted his guilt, but clearly wanted to die. Uh, the second individual uh, was very clearly guilty. The third individual, it was very small, uh, but clearly a doubt. And I commuted that to life in prison. During that interim eight years, though, a lot of things happened. Uh, most importantly is uh, a study by the American Bar Association found that 122 people across the nation who were on death row, meaning they were convicted and waited for execution, were found actually to be innocent. Uh, not a technicality judicial appeal, but actually they had the wrong person there. This was based uh, on DNA evidence. Largely. And most of it was DNA evidence. And so uh, thinking about that, if there were 122 at that time period, clearly in this country, we have executed innocent people. There's no question in my mind. I, I watched, there was a documentary done, and I watched uh, uh, then Governor, now President Bush, being asked because he had executed just an extraordinary number of people. I think it was 258 in one year or something like this. Um, that uh, was he confident that no one was innocent and that all of them were guilty? And he said, absolutely, they were all guilty. Defies logic when you think about it, if, if that many innocent were on death row. So we undertook, with uh, uh, strong uh, insistence from the community, uh, a analysis of what was going on in death penalty in Maryland. And what we found is that almost all of the seeking death penalty and the actual uh, uh, conviction with death penalty was in one county, Baltimore County. And so what has really happened now is that in Maryland, it has almost become a lottery of where the crime took place. Well, it seems to me that if you support the death penalty, and I think increasingly as a country we ought to look at this whole issue, but if you support the death penalty, presumably you want two things. One is absolute knowledge that no innocent person is going to be executed. The evidence lasts for years doesn't support that at all. Second, you want a fair, impartial system. In Maryland's case, it comes down to uh, geography. In many cases, it comes down to race and or income. There's a statistical study that shows a black murders a black, the likelihood of getting the death penalty is relatively limited. If a black murders a white, the likelihood of getting the death penalty is significantly greater. If a white murders a black, it's less. Now, this isn't right. This just absolutely is not right. So uh, I think maybe we should start with the question, why are we the only major Western country that still has a death penalty? And if we really want it, is the current system working at all? And I've come to the conclusion uh, increasingly that it's not, or at least it's not to the point that we ought to really pause and think about what we're doing. Gay rights is a personal family issue for you. Um, you've watched over the years as it's been used as a wedge issue, uh, most recently around the issue of gay marriage. Uh, what are your thoughts? Well, I said earlier about uh, an education, how much this comes from your personal experience. Um, in terms of uh, my personal experience, uh, my brother, who unfortunately is now dead, uh, was gay. Uh, he was in the Air Force for 19 years, a volunteer, uh, served uh, two tours of duty in Vietnam, and uh, unfortunately got AIDS. And uh, when he was dying of AIDS, he indicated to me that in a very, very painful death, that it was harder for him uh, to have lived a life where he was afraid to let anyone know his sexual orientation because he would have been dishonorably charged from the Air Force that he loved 
than it was to die this, this painful death. And, and I thought about it at the time, and it was just not right. And so I was county, ex I was picked up on the county council. We did amend the council law at that time to prohibit discrimination best based on sexual orientation. Uh, Western civilization did not collapse. Uh, and then when I went on as governor, uh, we did uh, exactly the same thing. It was a hard fought battle, uh, but it was the right thing to do. And again, uh, Maryland is not set back or anti-family or anything else just because we now say you can't discriminate. Uh, the next logical question uh, is whether people should be able to marry uh, same sex. You know, my reaction is how can you say we're not going to discriminate and you have full, equal legal protections if you cannot avail yourself of that legal document with all the protections that go with that. And so uh, I think it ought to be changed. I do find it very, very distasteful that people are using these issues to divide people. I think as, as elected officials, as community leaders, our obligation ought to be to bring people together, to help lead, to help people understand one another. You know, and, and I don't mean to be facetious about this, but um, uh, I guess the, the way I phrased it one time was that people that are obsessed with what's going on in other adults' bedrooms probably have problems in their own bedrooms. And uh, when I say it that way, I mean, I've never seen such an obsession on something that doesn't harm anyone. And so uh, I'm hoping that we get over uh, this, this um, uh, what do I say, um, just time of bad spirits in which people are deliberately using these issues to divide. You see the same thing now in the efforts to make the whole immigrant issue such a divisive issue. Um, and it makes no sense to me. I mean, you know, children born in the United States are American citizens, and yet we're saying we're going to take nine, ten million people and make them felons and, and kick them out of the country, uh, and their children are American citizens, so we separate them, or what do we do? I mean, this, this is just uh, wrong, and I hope we get over it. One decision that you did make um, in running for governor initially was the selection of Kathleen Kennedy Townsend as your running mate for lieutenant governor. And most people assume that you chose her because she's a Kennedy and the Kennedy mystique and that that would bring a certain kind of luster to your campaign. Uh, and that effectively anointed her as your successor or would be successor had she won the right. election. Uh, do you? hold yourself at all responsible for putting her in that position when, in retrospect, she really proved to be a very weak candidate and right. therefore lost the governorship for the Democrats? Right. Well, I look at it this way. Uh, uh, she was a very good lieutenant governor. She's a good person. Uh, the process was that I didn't really go out and seek a candidate or whatever. Uh, I asked people to uh, uh, bring together a, a list of candidates and I said to some extent they should compliment me. I guess in terms of politics as you know when uh, uh, Kennedy selected Johnson you know he was a Northeasterner so he took a Southerner, he was a Catholic so he took a Protestant so on. So I said in this way compliment me. Um, and, and what that meant was uh, I was from the Washington suburbs. Uh, the Washington suburbs have not elected a governor since 1869. Uh, so clearly you needed someone from the Baltimore area. I was a male. Could we have uh, a woman? Uh, what about African American, so on. That was the list I gave. So they came back uh, with uh, five uh, names, and I sat down and I talked with them, and it turned out to be five women, and I uh, talked with them and all. And uh, oh, I did say one thing I want ideologically compatible because I do not want this natural tension in the administration. And uh, uh, we just hit it off. I mean, she's a very, very good person. Um, unfortunately, she did not make, make it as governor. Uh, there have been stronger campaigns uh, run across this country. Uh, Let's talk about 2006. The gubernatorial candidates for the Democrats are Doug Duncan, county executive in Montgomery County, and Martin O'Malley, the mayor of Baltimore. Uh, tell me, who do you think uh, could run an effective campaign against Governor Ehrlich, and who do you think would make the better governor? Um, uh, Mr. Uh, Duncan, Doug Duncan, has had significant experience as an executive. He is very much policy oriented. Um, he's somewhat like me in terms of uh, out in the community, considered somewhat boring, uh, but uh, knows how to make government work, would be an excellent, excellent governor. Uh, Martin O'Malley uh, is an extraordinary good candidate, very active, very aggressive. I, I was just this morning at a large uh, 
a political event with the Democratic Governors Association, and I said to someone, because they asked me basically the same question, I said, if Doug Duncan were here, people would not even notice him unless they said, oh, isn't that Doug Duncan over there? If Martin O'Malley was here, he would come in with three cameras, he would shake everyone's hand, he would have their email address, you would get a mailing from him in the morning, and he would say, what an impressive candidate. I also believe, by the way, he will do a very good job, and I believe that Doug uh, is increasing his capabilities as a candidate. Either one of them, however, uh, in terms of substantive policies, I believe would be far, far better uh, than the incumbent administration. Let's talk about the U.S. Senate. Paul Sarbanes is vacating his seat. Uh, the leading candidates on the Democratic side are Congressman Ben Cardin, former Congressman, former NAAC, NAACP President Kwesi Nfume. On the Republican side, it's likely to be Lieutenant Governor Michael Steele. Right. Um, again, it's an um, uh, interesting mix here. Uh, former Congressman Nfumi uh, is by far the most dynamic. Uh, ideologically, he's uh, quite aggressive. Uh, I personally like him. I think he would be a tremendous U.S. Senator, tremendous. Uh, Mr. Cardin, on the other hand, uh, tends to be more uh, passive, laid back. Uh, you um, doesn't get out front on a lot of key issues. Uh, but I think the general sentiment probably correct is that he would be the better candidate in uh, November. There are, by the way, a couple of other very good candidates. Uh, I happen to think that uh, individuals like uh, Alan Lechman from uh, Montgomery County uh, extraordinarily knowledgeable, but it just takes a lot of money in the system we, we have today to, to be competitive, so we'll see whether he can overcome that uh, hurdle. Um, all of that notwithstanding, I think uh, either of the major Democratic candidates, or any of the major ones, uh, by far will do better uh, than uh, Mr. Steele. He's a nice person, uh, but uh, he is wrapped so tightly uh, with this national administration uh, that it's just not going to fly uh, in Maryland. I mean, uh, Why did you say before, um, after you evaluated Congressman Cardin, former Congressman Nfume, uh, that Congressman Cardin would be the more effective candidate? I think that uh, there's just a, a sense, I guess, that uh, Mr. Mfumi may be too progressive, uh, too strong on the end there. Personally, I like that. I mean, I like that a lot. Uh, but uh, are you going to be able to get to the center uh, that way? And that's the concern. Uh, so uh, uh, that's the only reason I say that uh, I think when the numbers come down, it's probably going to be Mr. Cardin versus Mr. Steele. And I think Mr. Gardner will win that handily. Uh, one more race I want to ask you about. It involves your old good pal, uh, uh, William Donald Schaefer, the uh, controller. Sure. Uh, Peter Francho, delegate, is running a spirited campaign against him. Right. Uh, number one, I like Peter. I've known him for years, Peter Francho. Uh, he, he knows government. He knows how to get things done. Uh, he uh, is uh, progressive. Uh, one of the things that people forget, you think of the comptroller by definition of the office and term, you think of that as being primarily the person that administers the money. Uh, in fact, the Comptroller is one of three votes on a board that we have that's called the Board of Public Works. That board approves every single contract and many, many policy decisions and becomes extremely important. All of that notwithstanding, I go back to my comments earlier about mean-spiritedness. Um, I think as an office holder, uh, you have an obligation to pe treat people with respect, to bring people together, uh, to help create a civil society. To call people, uh, you know, women professionals who are lawyers from Harvard and everything, little girl, uh, to call uh, African Americans Afros, as he did to former Treasurer Dixon, uh, to make uh, lewd comments about a woman's body as she's walking out of the room to say that uh, people with AIDS ought to be registered publicly and all. These are divisive characteristics. And I think as a state, uh, we ought to say we expect a lot more from our elected officials. Any chance you'll ever run for public office again? Uh, I've long since learned to, not to say never, but uh, I will tell you a group came to me, uh, including a number of significant leaders, wanted me to jump back into this governor's race, which. Uh, you can do after you sit out four years. And I told him, no, no. I, I was in office 31 years, and uh, I loved every moment of it uh, at all the different levels of government. But 31 years of elected office uh, uh, 
it's time to look for other things. Uh, I do look for very continued active uh, involvement. Uh, I am involved um, uh, in the environmental movement all across the country. I work very aggressively there, involved with a number of governors, Democrat, Republican, uh, in um, new administration. Uh, would love to offer whatever uh, capabilities I might have. Uh, but uh, most you importantly were, at this stage. Many people thought that if Al Gore were elected that you would become the EPA Administrator or Interior Secretary. Is that something that you would like to do? Um, I think we'd leave that to whoever the future uh, president may be, but uh, uh, either in government or out government, I, I think I've still got a couple uh, decades of uh, good progressive leadership left in me. Many thanks to Governor Paris Clendenning for joining us today and best of luck to you in Thank pursuing you. your smart growth agenda. I'm Mark Cohen, and this has been Coffee House Forum. Wonderful. Welcome, Ariana. Thank and you. And Kiva to the coffee house. Good to see you again. Uh, and when we say good to see you again, uh, I'm thinking back to the days when there was no testosterone in the group. That's true. That was very long ago. What, when did... Uh, 1989 was when we uh, started. And it was probably within about a year that we had our token male, John right. Perry, joined the band. 
<laughs> then it became more testosterone laden as we got yeah. further into it. Now we're, over, we're overwhelmed with testosterone now. <laughs> what, um, how many recordings does the band have? Uh, I think this is the one coming up right now. This will make it nine. Okay. And I, I happen to, hold on. Yes. Those of you watching at home. <laughs> um, I happen to have uh, the album cover for the upcoming one. Just happen to have it. Yes. The there it is. Isn't it amazing? The same song, <laughs> Out of the Corner of the Eye. Yep. The title cut. That's right. And when we were talking uh, backstage, so to speak, the, the title means... Well, the title means, it, as the song means, it's the, those things, those creatures, those beings that just are right out of the corner of the eye that you just The ones don't that I've been seeing see. all the time yeah. and never really told anybody. That's right. You got it. Yeah. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, another thing I notice about your band, mm -hmm. it's people come to see you perform, but they're also part of the performance. Because I've been true. to some shows at the uh, Unitarian Church, and people are up dancing, and kids are running around, and... It's really, you, if you're coming there to just sit in the audience and be entertained, eh, that happens, but you can really get up there and, and groove. And it, the sense of community that you guys get is it's just fabulous. And That's really one of the things we love about being yeah. Kiva is because we're sort of, we have sort of like a mini Grateful Dead experience. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking of that, actually. I was sitting there going, it's kind of a Grateful Alive experience. Yes, exactly. In, in a, yes, yeah. definitely. I would say it's um, even better, yeah. It's, it's just great. Um, take us out with an on the song which one is it, and does it happen to be on this one coming up? Yes, see, uh, we're doing Praise the Winter, and yes, it is on this one. Great. I think actually everything we're doing tonight is on this one. So There you go. Yep. All right. Take okay. us home. Okay.
Welcome to Rewind at the Coffee House. Coming up June 13th through 18th, the premier film festival in the D.C. area. Now in its fourth year, Silver Docs brings both a huge selection of the best documentary films to the AFI Silver Theater in Silver Spring. It also brings a touch of Hollywood glamour. What's on tap this year? With us is Patricia Finneran, Silver Docs Festival Director. Welcome, Trish, to the Coffee House. It's great to be here. So what do you got? Well, gosh, going into our fourth year, I really think we are kind of hitting it out of the ballpark, to use a sports metaphor. Um, well, it's a six-day festival. Um, we'll have almost 100 films re representing dozens of countries. We're actually locking the program even as we speak. Um, but some of the most exciting things we have happening this year is well, the name that kind of pops for everybody, I think, is um, our Charles Guggenheim Symposium, which honors a great filmmaker every year. We're honoring Martin Scorsese for his work um, in the documentary field, his musical films, his cultural films, and it's a great thing for the American Film Institute. He was one of our Life Achievement Award winners, and then to come and, and receive our I don't think most people think of Martin Scorsese as a documentary filmmaker, but tell us about one of the documentary films that are, it will appear that <laughs> is his. Yeah, I think um, The Last Waltz, which is one of my sort of favorite music documentaries of all time, which is about the sort of last year of the, of the band. We will play that film outside for the community, actually, and we're really excited. Robbie Robertson, who was the lead singer, is actually going to come and um, introduce Martin Scorsese and... Um, His former college roommate. Yes, which, which was a wonderful tidbit of trivia I just found out. And then the program itself will include um, clips from his documentary work and then really be a conversation. And he'll be in conversation with the fabulous independent documentary filmmaker Jim Jarmusch, who you might know, um, you know Broken Flowers, Coffee and Cigarettes, um, which I think is kind of fun and unusual and gives a different kind of um, vibe to that evening. So we're excited about that. Um, the two of the big programs we're doing this year, in addition to our competition and our worldview, we're doing a whole program on South Africa. It's the 30th anniversary of the Soweto uprisings on Friday, June 16th, which is smack dab in the middle of our festival, which runs June 13th to the 18th. And that Friday night, we will premiere a film that was commissioned for this 30th anniversary and show that outdoors for the community. And then there'll be several films in the South Africa program that we'll show within the body of the festival that are just some really extraordinary work that show the sort of depth and breadth and diversity of what's happening in South Africa today. And I think people will be excited about that. Where will the outdoor uh, screenings be? They happen, um, the AFI Silver Theater is of course on Colesville Road with Discovery Communications, our, our partner across the street. In Silver at, Spring. In Silver Spring. And then the downtown Silver Spring area is where the concerts happen. And then there's a place called Veterans Plaza, which is a, just a little bit further down. And that's where the outdoor screenings will be. We actually moved them down there because we've had so many people. Um, we wanted to be able to accommodate we can now accommodate it sort of up to 15,000 people, which is a huge number of people. Um, so we, we moved it there to really make it as accessible as possible for the whole community. For the festival itself, 100 films, how do you pick 100 films from the whole body of documentary works that are out there? Well, luckily I don't do it all by myself. Um, we have a director of programming um, who just moved down this year and is making her debut this year. Her name's Sky Sidney, and she oversees it. We work really closely together. We start out our season in the fall, and we go to a lot of the big festivals. We go to, to Toronto. We go to a big festival in Amsterdam. We go to Sundance. Um, so there's that in terms of tracking what's happening and inviting films. We maintain relationships in the industry, and then we get submissions. And this year we received um, 1,669 submissions. Um, which is a lot. <laughs> it's a lot of films. And you have to view each of these? Yes, we have um, a, a, a programming team that works with, with me and in, in for the Silver Docs Festival, and then we have about 20 volunteers who actually screen an enormous amount of work. And it's a pretty fun process, actually. People do it because you get together every week and talk about what you saw and argue about what you're passionate about. And so the selection process. It, yeah. Uh, there's a first cut, I gather. Yeah. And then it goes to whom, and, and it, how do you decide? Um, how do you decide? It's ultimately about balance. You want the, the festival to be balanced, to have 
um, some of the films that are on, out on the festival circuit. Um, later we're going to look at a clip from a film called The Trials of Daryl Hunt, which was at Sundance in full frame. It's an important film, a film we wanted to include in the program. Um, so you want to have some of those films, and then you also want to be a place that's launching new work. Um, so you're looking at films in that way too. So uh, we have a whole program on global health this year, looking at health issues all over the world. And that program has almost all world premieres. Um, so there's an extraordinary film called The Breast Cancer Diaries in that program about um, a woman from Maine who was a former sports uh, newscaster, uh, mother of two, diagnosed with breast cancer and is courageous enough to videotape her entire process. And it's a story about family and about fighting cancer, and it's incredibly moving. Um, so it's a little hard to answer your question. It's about, and it's also sort of balance of subject matter. You know, you want to, you don't want to have all the films. There's a huge number of films out there right now about the war in Iraq. So there are films made from the Iraqi perspective, films made from the American perspective. What about the troops when they come home? Um, there's some interesting films out there about th what happens when they come home and how we're serving our soldiers and our veterans um, or not serving our soldiers and veterans in some cases. Um, and those are really important stories that I think people are going to want to see um, in depth. You, know. you mentioned before that one of the films is The Trials of Daryl Hunt, and we do have a clip of that. So why don't we take a look? didn't argue evidence. Dean Bowman argued that you should put yourself in the shoes of a different human being and subject yourself to what she was exposed to that morning. The defense attorneys argued he doesn't have any evidence. The man was playing on your emotions. Get over it. Look at the facts. The facts are shoddy eyewitnesses no murder weapon, no sperm. Come on, guys, wake up. You've got this to weigh in the jury room and this to weigh in the jury room. Uh, so tell me what happened in that film. Well, it's a pretty extraordinary story, actually. Daryl Hunt, um, Basically, it's a 12-year odyssey of his, of um, trying to prove his innocence. Um, he was ultimately released, um, but it was a 12-year battle, and the film tracks that battle. It's a film about racism. It's a film about the criminal justice system in America, and um, in a way, it's also a film about the power of the media to do its job and raise awareness. Um, there's a newspaper reporter that kind of comes along about in the middle of the battle that really energizes the movement because his lawyers are fighting fighting like heck for him. And, um, and so it's actually an interesting story too because the filmmakers are independent filmmakers who have tracked this story over, over 12 years. And um, it's incredibly moving and Daryl Hunt himself is sort of an extraordinary person in that he never becomes bitter or cynical. He um, is a fighter and is a really kind of it comes through in the film that he's really a sort of a genuinely good person um, wrongly convicted and um, he's actually coming to the festival so I think that's going to be a pretty special screening that we're looking forward to. And you have a kind of auteur a director in Tom Friedman uh, tell me about the film that he's well, going to be no, doing. You know, Tom Friedman, the Pulitzer Prize winning um, best-selling author, um, he, you know, the, the world is flat and now he's looking a lot at energy issues um, and this is a brand new film called Addicted to Oil and it really looks at the energy issues and oil from the demand side and um, he's just a great reporter which we all know but he just also makes these issues really accessible um, and really kind of takes you through and spends a lot of time the Toyota people are going to love him. He spends a lot of time in the Prius. Um, so, and he's coming and showing the film and then doing a, a program with the New York Times. Um, so it's a film done for the Discovery Channel, but we're doing a program with the New York Times. It's a Times talk, so people can come and there'll be a really great discussion afterwards and can ask Tom questions. Uh, what distinguishes Silver Docks from other film festivals? I think... Um, one of the things is our location. I mean, obviously, we're an all-documentary festival, so that's different. Um, but our location, we can just take advantage of the, the richness and diversity of the Washington, D.C. area and really um, take films and really 
deal with the issues in the films in, in a community where people are incredibly supportive and come out and turn out for these films. Um, in terms of politics, we're excited this year. Our conference, which is our professional program for filmmakers, is looking at the future of real, the future of nonfiction programming. And former Vice President Al Gore will come and give the keynote speech um, about the future of public media and ensuring um, that we all have access, like we do here, to the marketplace of ideas. And will his film be screened as well? His film will have already opened. His film is opening June 2nd in the Washington, D.C. area. Um, and I will actually give a plug for it because I've seen it twice and it's really extraordinary. Um, What's it, it called? It's called um, An Inconvenient Truth, which is the inconvenient truth of global warming. And um, it's sort of his slideshow, but it's, it's souped up and really a wonderfully human story um, by a filmmaker named Davis Guggenheim about Al Gore and about um, Of the Guggenheim family? Yes, of the Guggenheim family. It's a very small world. So he's a native Washingtonian, the filmmaker. So, What are you most looking forward to at, the, at this festival? Um, I think I'm most looking forward to meeting the filmmakers. You kind of view hundreds of films and then you fall in love with certain films. And, um, and that's what I love, when you get to meet the filmmakers and find out about their process and, and really connect to them. Um, that's something that, that really matters to me. And, and, then, and who are you most looking forward to meeting? Um, oh, that's a good question. Um, there's a couple of South African filmmakers. There's a film called A Family Affair, um, which is about the Makahena family in, uh, in South Africa who are incredibly powerful musical family. And the filmmaker named Bev Titsi is quite extraordinary in terms of her commitment. And I'm really interested in, in, in meeting her. Um, Nick Broomfield, the filmmaker who made Eileen Life and Death of a Serial Killer and Biggie and Tupac, um, quite the kind of hot British filmmaker and quite the kind of filmmaker impresario. Um, really strong film uh, called My Big White Self, which is actually about South Africa. Um, he's coming, and I'm kind of fascinated to, to meet him and, and have him be part of the festival. If people want to learn more about the festival, how can they find it? They should go to www.silverdocs.com, which is our website, and you can buy passes. Um, the only way to go to the conference and some of the bigger events is actually to be a pass holder because we have we actually sell out almost all the films, so we reserve some of the bigger events for pass holders. So we encourage you to buy passes. You can also just buy individual tickets to the screenings, though. We'll see you there. Yes, look forward to it. Many thanks to festival director Patricia Finneran for uh, Silver Docs preview. Uh, well, that's quite a selection of films you got on tap this year. I'm Mark Cohen, and this has been Rewind.